everyone. Um, thanks a lot for joining us today. We are here with Hilary Lovey, the Commercial Innovation Manager at John Lewis and Partners. I'm Yuki Jorina from the Future London Academy and today we are going to discuss innovation processes, methodologies, what happens inside John Lewis and Partners. Thanks Hilary for joining us today. You're welcome. How are you doing? Yeah, not bad, thank you very much. I have my tea. Oh, good. I'll keep caffeine up. Very, very British. Yes, it is very British. <laughs> so, uh, my first question to you will be to explain a bit more about your role at John Lewis. And also, for those who don't know what John Lewis is, because we have a lot of international audience, explain a little bit why is it so special? John Lewis is a kind of uh, it a department store, and I guess something of a British institution. We're over 150 years old, and the thing that makes it really distinctive is um, that we are a co-ownership. So the people who work in our um, in our business are actually owners of it. So we're partners um, rather than employees. And I'll come, probably it'll come up a few times in terms of how that has quite a definite impact mm-hmm. on how um, how we are as a as an organization but to give you a sense of scale the products we sell them so we have both um, branded products and own brand products which we develop in-house we've got our own studios we have a production capability we have international sourcing so there's a huge amount around the kind of the product piece and then we also have um, a thriving online business and um, services are much more besides Brilliant. And what do you do as a commercial innovation manager? Because I think also innovation is such a vague vo- word nowadays. It yeah. can be anything. I think that's I think that's the, the, very much the case. And I think maybe one of the first things to highlight is I'm not um, the only innovation resource in the team. I think in the business rather. And I think that's um, very much kind of marked of our approach. So rather than having an innovation department that owns innovation with a person that has responsibility for it, instead it's very much something that is the responsibility of everyone in the organisation. If you just look at home area, we've got, I don't know, about uh, 40,000 lines and about 13% of those will be new like every season. So there's a tremendous pace of change. Um, so rather than innovation living in one place, it has a number of different um, hubs, I guess would be the best way of describing it. And my role then, um, so I would sit within our commercial and trading part of the business. The, the role that I have really is around enabling um, innovation kind of probably a bit like an internal consultant or as I like to think of it like an ideas midwife so it's about <laughs> helping teams to solve solve problems but I think um, the support that I get then is through through facilitation or through mentoring so mm-hmm. we have um, a tools and a framework that we can support teams with and I also have a, a wider community of innovation champions that are spread out across the business there's 50 of those mm-hmm. then they have uh, an innovation toolkit a responsibility to help enable innovation mm-hmm. Uh, across across multiple teams and I coordinate that group as well and so the kind of kickoff point for anybody coming into the program is a three-day training piece Mm -hmm. and that has um, I guess the the kind of a practical piece about giving people tools that help them with an approach and also with the kind of mindset behavior piece Mm -hmm. and we very much focus on um, some practical facilitation practice as part of that because we know that's the way that most people will interact with this with with the expertise Mm -hmm. they're going to share it's also the part about the, the kickoff of building a community because mm-hmm. I think the, net, the network of those catalysts themselves is really, um, really interesting. And we, we go on to continue maintaining that, but having that three days together at the beginning really helps, helps build that in. And how do you maintain that community? Because I think you're mm. right, this is such an important part mm. of going uh, beyond those three days where everyone gets yeah. excited and it's like, oh, sounds great. Yeah. And then they go back to their teams yeah. and their jobs and it becomes very hard. Yeah. So do they have like a monthly meetups or how do they support yeah. each other? And we do, we keep, we keep kind of like, it's one of these things we keep ourselves um, checking in. I think it's really important to keep innovating your like mm-hmm. innovation approach. And so we've done regular points where we've um, gathered everyone together and we've almost co-created what we want to be and how we want to work but at the moment some of the things that have worked well for us have been around like google hangouts so we mm-hmm. use kind of conversation and equally a, a google page where people will um, post shout outs when they've either seen something that's interesting when they'll be asking for help we very much again encourage people to work in pairs so they might be like oh, i've got a brief on this has anyone got any good tools i'd like to suggest has anyone got a good, good bit of a um, case study or an example could someone help me mm-hmm. and that in itself keeps some of that that relationship going 
okay, so we stopped where they go through the three-day workshop. Mm-hmm. Now they have this uh, community of people mm-hmm. uh, that can support them. What happened next? They go back to their jobs and the next brief or the next problem that comes into them, they like, okay, I'm applying this methodology to solve it or how does it work? I think it's a bit of a mixture. So um, certainly on a, on a base case, we'd expect everyone to apply it to mm-hmm. the day job. And that again is part of who comes onto the program is kind of thinking about Mm -hmm. um, their opportunity to apply it in their their day job. So we tend to pick people who've already got some good scope and maybe have got um, some meaty stuff coming through that they can they can mm-hmm. use it on. So that certainly is a piece about encouraging them on that one. And then the other one is about how to help make sure that we get them focused on other briefs within the, within the wider business. So they're a resource not just for their immediate team, but for the organisation. And that's something we've been, I guess, fine tuning and developing and playing around with mm-hmm. over the last few years. I suppose it's very difficult still for them, even with the support, mm. to install this new mentality and way of doing things and work with the rest of their teams that way. Because I, we worked with lots of organisations who kind of sometimes complain yeah. that uh, it's all great it's all fantastic mm-hmm. but as soon as we start uh, talking about this to our colleagues there is a lot of resistance especially if it's someone who has been in a company for a very long time mm-hmm. and used to a very certain way of doing things and suddenly this new way of doing approach comes about how do you deal with that do you give any advice on how to change the rest of their team and change the rest of their department I think I think certainly in the first instance, some of it was about getting um, building the kind of confidence, mm-hmm. not just capability of that team. So hence why some of the community stuff's really important. And I think that's why certainly within the training, as we've kind of um, again like we try things and this, uh, myself and the the deliverer say team, then we kind of talk about comparing how things have worked. But we very much made a practical element part of that kickoff. So there's almost safe experimentation of like actually okay, if I was going to run something, if I want to run a, a kickoff meeting in a totally different way and get people to think about their brief. Mm-hmm. Let's do it now with people, with my peers in a mm-hmm. safe space. Because I think certainly the, the previous versions yeah. where we didn't do that, it then felt like a, it was a big jump then to mm-hmm. go back into a team and then launch out. And we've also taken very much more of you now that people should buddy up. Because again, it's like, mm-hmm. I think there's a, there's a confidence piece and also actually practicality. I know when I worked in an agency, we always, you know, we'd go out in pairs. It's so useful to have somebody who's driving the actual activity and someone else who can take a helicopter view to look from above mm. and keep that weather eye and go, actually, hang on a second, are we covering the stuff we need to cover? Where are we going? Do we need to kind of course correct? And, and keeping those two as separate yeah. roles within a session is also very useful. So, yeah, I think that's helpful to try and get people to have the confidence to to kick off within their, their teams. And when you say buddy up, that does it mean that it will be another innovation catalyst who helps them? Or is it someone from their team who wasn't part of this initial training and meeting who becomes their trustee? and helps them to spread it across the team? I think it's, it's worked in very different ways and often we've kind of, um, people have got interested and kind of get brought mm-hmm. in but typically we're trying to encourage people to buddy up with someone else who's done the training so mm-hmm. you can both kind of support each other actually facilitating. And again though, I think even, even now we've been doing some interesting plays lately about partnering up with people from different innovation expertise and so mm-hmm. we've got, as I mentioned earlier, we've got different hubs of innovation approach. So I, I worked at a workshop recently where I um, buddied up with some of our, one of our UX designers and that was a really interesting cross fertilization of trying yeah. to understand different tools again. Like what, mm-hmm. what do we need now? What would most help this group unlock their challenge? Mm-hmm. Okay, let's let's have one of your empathy maps. Well, we'll bring in like a focus ladder. Okay, I think that you know that will help us get to where we need to go. Okay, let's talk about the tools. While you mentioned mm. them, you mentioned like different stages mm. of the process that kind of help with this innovation mm. journey. So let's start from the very beginning. What kind of tools uh, do you have in your toolkit, or do you mm. advise in your first workshops that help to kick off this process? Any examples? And I'll give you work? a few. And I think we we spend a lot of time thinking both what we need from a session or what we need to Mm -hmm. deliver and also how we need to deliver it. So it's kind of a bit of a balance when you're choosing which tool. And I think they're always very pragmatic. So I think there's um, everything from a focus ladder is is a really useful starting one. And it's a bit like people who are familiar with CI, the the five whys and trying to think about root cause. But I think the difference, it goes up and down. So the idea is you have a a ladder Mm -hmm. and you can normally start with your um, statement of your problem in the beginning and then you get the team to think about possible reasons why so to take it higher up the ladder Mm -hmm. and become bigger so why are we interested in this brief and then you also get them to generate multiple options of how you could deliver this brief so it kind of takes you down in the detail Mm -hmm. and then have a debate about whether where the brief started is indeed the best place to mm. to focus your question because often i think the, the question itself will lead you to very different answers we do a lot of things up front with the problem owner in terms of what what are the capabilities rather than necessarily people but what capabilities are we going to need to come up with a great answer and take it through to launch and if somebody's going to later on need to pick it up then actually let's think about having them in at the beginning because if they feel they've 
and been part of that solution, then they will be far more invested in making it making it come to yeah. fruition. Brilliant. So you've run this workshop. How many people usually is in this workshop? Is it? Oh, when we do things, it really varies. But I would I like as a rule of thumb try and get kind of under twelve. I think, okay. um, and the the tighter the number, the the better yeah. the conversations. But I think sometimes you have to be there's a bit of pragmatic flex around um, thinking about who who needs to be engaged. And what's the minimum? It's like three, two. Oh, if- I, I think certainly I've done it in the past where you might have had yeah three or four people might okay. have, have come in. It's yeah. Okay. So you run this workshop, yep. you identify your problem uh, that you're planning to solve. What happened next? I think, again, it really varies. So sometimes we might end up um, being involved going forward through mm-hmm. the next stage. So it might be then thinking about where you're going to go for um, having looked at a number of tools, what mm-hmm. information you already have. You then go, OK, well, what fresh understanding do we need? And so, again, we might think about some tools to encourage the group mm-hmm. as a whole to go out and collect mm-hmm. data and to do that in a way which really mixes things mixes things up so there's always some useful predictable bits of data that you might want so you whether it's your Mintel reports or your sales data but it's encouraging people to look for different sources of data mm-hmm. that give them the spark almost for a great idea okay so it's kind of a research stage I suppose yeah. in, in that sense but very much more I think hands-on I think I'm sure everyone um, who's been again um, you obviously been involved in innovation be um, familiar with often that bit where you, you read something and you mm-hmm. go and instinctively that doesn't feel quite right yeah and then it's actually when you go out and you either are the consumer mm-hmm. and you go and walk in their shoes and you go mm, actually that is that is different or you actually are um with a customer and um seeing them and using a product or in a certain situation and you go that behavior is not what they what mm. what i've read and those contradictions are often the place where you get the, you know, the best sparks for ideas and this research or do you have a name for this stage by the way oh so we call it explore explore but i try not to be too hung up on words because i think it's one of those things that's very interesting around language yeah. in this process and i think because there are all these different approaches sometimes everyone gets very you know, like well we're doing this and this is our tool and this is our yeah. name and actually innovation thrives on collaboration so the more we can bring it together the better I'm glad, so glad you said that because I think this is what we're always trying to tell people like no mm. matter what you call each stage no matter what methodology yeah. you use yeah. it's it's all about people it's all about finding the solution so if something doesn't work yeah. for you rename it change exactly. it yeah. exactly I think if you kind of almost think about you can almost do your focus ladder on um, on the innovation approach and be like well actually why are we doing this and mm-hmm. fundamentally all of the approaches are kind of united by you know wanting to get really clear on the brief mm-hmm. really empathising and understanding with the target customer collaborating Collaborating and experimenting and I think all of us do that in slightly different ways and maybe with slightly different um, twists but fundamentally we are all we all buy into the same kind of core yeah. beliefs so, and, yeah. and in your process was it based on like I don't know Stanford methodology like disco ideas what, what was it based on is it purely I think it's a bit of a blend there are elements of agile and lean in it but there's also a lot around kind of industry best industry best practice mm-hmm. so yeah it's a kind of it's kind of blend do you have any again tools or any structured approach to this explore stage where you say um, you have one week or two weeks and each of you needs to speak to at least one customer or read yeah. at least one report I think there's um, I guess kind of two um, chunks of um, tools or kind of um, tips we tend to use I think one is around the what we're going to go and, and investigate and that normally we pragmatically get a bit of, actually have a brainstorm of generating lots of possible mm-hmm. um, activities we could do knowing hopefully from our first stage what we already already know we've mm-hmm. got a good sense from the first stage what things, what knowledge exists in, already in the business so for those gaps within um, brainstorm we try and push people into thinking both getting things that are very much like in your river of thinking so the, the things that are kind of quite familiar sources mm-hmm. and then we try and say okay we also need to think of some things that are very sort of deeper versions mm-hmm. of that and then things that are lateral examples so where else in the world has this challenge or problem and let's go and understand a little bit of that we also encourage people to think about um, gathering data both by being the customer going with the customer and mm-hmm. then about the customer and that could be research but that could just as easily be thinking about uh, speaking to someone who knows your target audience mm-hmm. so I don't know like if you were doing Valentine's gifts you might go and speak to a florist yeah or you might go and speak to the recipient so you try and look at the, the mm-hmm. different, different perspectives and I guess within that it's just around balance I think it's a bit like a making a stew there's kind mm-hmm. of like meat and potato you need your kind of like yeah. more stuff which is kind of like you're kind of your yeah. normally you're kind of in river and your deeper stuff yeah but you do need to have some of these kind of lateral um, pieces a bit like herbs or spices which will be the thing that will mm-hmm. lift it so it's about getting a mix okay so what are the other little things that you can include in that process that might be a bit different from I don't know what other people are doing or something that's very special for 
I think it's around trying to make sure then you have got these mixture of different kinds mm-hmm. of activities in your lateral um, pieces. And then really it's around frameworks for helping mm-hmm. you then use that mm-hmm. data. So we get everyone to bring back data as facts, mm-hmm. so rather than hunches. And we just have a big, we have a big session normally where you then get all the data on a wall and we get people to pick out their themes mm-hmm. and flip it into opportunities. And I think it's, it's not a complex thing, but it's often as a step, something we don't necessarily think about enough before we leap you know, before people leap straight yeah. into an idea. Oh, brilliant. So let's dive deeper into this um, time when you get together to discuss uh, what everyone found. So first of all, how do people document? Do you have, I don't know, an online tool where everyone logs in and puts what they found? Or is it literally everyone scribbles in their notebooks and or do people take pictures or... Uh, I think a mixture yeah. of, um, of things. I have done um, projects in the past which we've... Um, use technology Mm -hmm. um, particularly when I was consulting and you'd have teams in multiple locations Mm -hmm. and it was almost that everyone could see what was being um, collected Mm and and be able to share that actually for us we we're very low tech we tend to use paper and it's just a question of people bringing often facts on Mm post-its so people would pull out their information and it's very much emphasized to people the need for it to be a fact and not already an assumption or a hypothesis Mm -hmm. or an idea and what do you mean by a fact is it a quote from a customer it could be yes it could be um, so it'll, it'll either be something with the steer you kind of say it might start with I saw I heard I read this person said or mm-hmm. it could be a, it could be a s- statistic so it could equally be you know 55% of people blah 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 according mm-hmm. to Mintel so then you put all these things on the wall mm-hmm. in the workshop what happens next then it's around using that that kind of collective creativity and uh, like just the kind of the curiosity of the group mm-hmm. so getting people individually to view that wall and to think about the, what are the themes that are hitting them um, different people will see totally different mm-hmm. things in the data and that is also so part about generating lots of options and so really we just encourage everyone to go and pick out a theme based on a number of different facts capture it and then turn it into an opportunity so how could we unlock mm-hmm. that particular theme and how do you then pick what kind of things you'll focus on or discuss further how did this process happen i think again it's very much about tapping into the power of the group so i think you'll often find there's initially often there's a bit of deduplication you can do anyway yeah. because people might have come up with different mm-hmm. um come up with similar similar yeah. themes or thoughts so you might find there's a bit of a, a piece and then as a group we'll often it is then about thinking about well okay which are the things which feel like they are I guess kind of more foundational insights, things that feel like they may be more hygiene factors that we need to bear in mind and we can kind of go, okay, we mustn't forget about this. And that is definitely a theme, but mm-hmm. let's, that doesn't feel quite so, so springy for our mm-hmm. ideas. So we might move those out and then start looking then at the ones that are left, which are the ones that we, we kind of feel would most match back against our brief. And I'd normally look, I guess, to the problem owner at that point as well to, mm-hmm. to help us select the most, the most useful. And do you pick one, three, is it oh, do you have many. a limit? Yeah, so we'd normally take several through at that point mm-hmm. because then you you then want to take a number through for ideas. I think we're still very much in that expansive mm-hmm. phase on a kind of, you know, I know innovations, you know, lots of diamonds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's again, <laughs> you know, we want to kind of give ourselves some breadth. At this point, we don't know which is the mm-hmm. most um, interesting opportunity mm-hmm. area to go after. So you would want to take a number of those through. Mm-hmm. And then through your next phase in itself, you'll see how how much do they inspire interesting ideas and that in itself will start helping you evolve your thinking. So does the next stage, I assume that's kind of yeah. ideation, yeah. creative stage, does it happen in that workshop as well or do you take time to kind of reflect on everything you've just seen and kind of come up with your own ideas first and then you regroup? How does that work? Um, I have to say, again, very flexible, yeah. adaptable approach, but I think um, it's often helpful to have it's helpful to have a bit of breathing space often, particularly to bring some stimulus for the ideas mm-hmm. workshop. So you can tailor that to the, the kind of the themes that are coming out. And it might want you might want to think a little bit about turning the themes that you have into something that will help stimulate ideas. But it, pragmatically, you know, if you have if mm-hmm. if you have to, you know, you might go straight into ideas. I think the key thing is just is um, we'd normally discourage people from coming to an ideas workshop with mm. their ideas already in play. And I think one of the tips I remember from my um, from my what if days, we always used to kind of um, kick off with asking people to, you know, first burst, just to kind of surface the stuff that people have already come, sometimes have in their heads. You need to kind of get that out. And then you mm. can then as a group really then start um, building and co-creating, which is so important. So then this next workshop happens, the ideation creation workshop. How do you call that one? Um, so explode. Explo- explode. Oh, yeah. I love it. Oh, I know it's ease. We're oh. on our ease. <laughs> Brilliant. So explode workshop uh, where you kind of come up with all these different ideas. I assume it's still the same group of people that started that comes to that workshop as well. Or do you bring new people in? Um, 
there's, there's often a like a high I think either kind of high degree of consistency mm-hmm. sometimes there might be people that might come in either for all or some of that session because they might have some particular mm-hmm. knowledge and I guess also you don't I think when you kick off a project sometimes through through the process you start getting a better sense of the the ways you might want to unlock it mm-hmm. and that might start suggesting different people than maybe mm-hmm. you already had in your group yeah okay so the explore the workshop happens what do you use um, for to get ideas out? Because another thing that a lot of organizations mm. struggle with is working with different people from different departments and creating mm. this diversity in the room, which is very important mm. to come up with good ideas. It's not very easy to manage because some people are more reserved, some people are more creative mm. and overpower the kind of the other mm. ideas, as well as some people just don't know where to even start. I think that's where things like having tools and a framework are really mm-hmm. helpful because I think some people I think really thrive on having some kind mm-hmm. of um, a, an activity or, a, or or some way of actually unlocking their creativity. And I think we also, um, when we're doing our kind of training, we also talk a lot about how to get people's brain in the right state for creativity. Um, and I'm sure you've touched on this in the in, in the past, but in terms of like getting people into a, like an alpha brain state, which is what what's the advice? Well, so it's it's very much about you need to try and get people out of their their immediate kind of task focus. So I think you've got four different brain states. Mm-hmm. Alpha, which is the best for creativity and collaboration, it's when you're kind of most relaxed, kind of like um, yeah, it's like a good, happy, relaxed place, as opposed to most of us in our busy work days when you're at your desk, when you're very decisive. It's like you just need to plow mm-hmm. through stuff, and at that point, that's not a great place to be if you want people to yeah. um, explore and create. So there are lots of ways people can, can get that right that right brain state before you kick off a session, whether that's through the environment and thinking about you know not having your meetings in a in a boardroom, mm-hmm. trying to keep away from PowerPoint, which again can often trigger people back into that. Um, <laughs> well, I'm going to have a sit little back now and have a little bit of a judgy face. <laughs> through to having a walk, um, having a laugh. So we, we do lots of different mm-hmm. things in a session to try and get people into a place where they can get their brain in the right place for mm-hmm. it. And also we'll explicitly call it out as well up front. So it's, I think it's a bit about contracting at the beginning where you want mm-hmm. to ask people to, to let go, embrace, you know, embrace being curious, kind of lean into the process. Mm-hmm. So that, that helps as so well. So you prepare people's mental state to yeah. be creative and open-minded and curious. And then do you have like any sort of activity, like a traditional brainstorm? Or is mm-hmm. it more like a, some, some sort of matrix where you come up with different ideas? What do you... I think again, it's I mean, it's really interesting actually. It's, there's lots of different things, and I think we're constantly adding to the adding to the toolkit. I think some of this around just as a general principle about how to capture an idea. So we we typically would normally encourage people to spend some time on an idea and, and build it up a bit as a group. Mm-hmm. So rather than just throwing out like one words, it's kind of okay. Well, think about it. Ask some questions a little about it. Catch it as a picture, no matter how rubbish the art. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's just like kind of okay. So how how might that be? How might that work? And sometimes that almost having that conversation before you start scribbling it, you mm-hmm. just stop getting a bit of a sense of the idea itself. But we will do different ways to spark people into that, whether it's um, sometimes we might give people um, a task to go, okay, well, what are the rules around this particular thing? So what are, what are the current rules of this category or the cut- current rules about how we um, how we work? Okay, what if we broke them? Mm-hmm. Okay, take that to an extreme. Just imagine, so what if? How, what would have to be true? So you might give them that as a stimulus. Or we might think about um, where else in the world has this challenge? And then you'd ask them to think about think mm-hmm. about that particular scenario and think what are the principles okay well, how do those principles apply themselves to what we're doing now yeah so it's, there's lots of different different ways around it mm-hmm. and i think just i think recently last week i started having a, um, a bit of a play with the crazy eights from one of the other yes uh, design methodologies and again that's you know it's all about flexing, flexing can you explain crazy eight for people who well, I haven't just, done it before i am very new this myself and it was really just about giving people a very limited period of time mm-hmm. to individually just bat out mm-hmm. a number of ideas very quickly and then after that then putting those on a wall and thinking about actually what are almost working back up and mm-hmm. going what are the things that these are suggesting where mm-hmm. are we seeing some themes and that can be sometimes quite interesting when you've got people who um I tend to go to a very concrete place with their ideas sometimes it's an easier something when I used it it was just an easier way to go at it to get people to start getting something out and getting some ideas on mm-hmm. out on the table and then we kind of go okay there's some themes that are emerging here so does it feel like there's something in this space that could be interesting yeah. and then we can kind of go back on it that way and is it i assume it's one of your innovation catalysts or yourself mm. who facilitates mm. this session to kind of make sure it goes so it doesn't become like a case where everyone has ideas and new approaches and new ways of coming up with ideas there is some structure to the session yeah we would have a plan for how we want the session to run and a sense of okay we're going to spend x amount of time doing this kind of exercise mm-hmm. and we'll brief it in and then we'll we'll move it on so mm-hmm. we kind of will navigate people through that um through that approach normally and you prepare that before the session
session you already know what kind of tools you will use yeah. what kind of examples you will give and yeah I think I was I used to be in I think it's that thing about like being being prepared so you yeah. normally have some extras yeah. and check-in points in a session where you might want to talk to your other um, fellow facilitator or your problem owner because if something's maybe not working or gelling you might need to you know, think about it even in the moment and go, actually I think we need to do something a bit different here this isn't really working for them but yeah there is normally a guideline of what we're, what we're planning on doing great so then you come up with all this explosion of ideas yeah <laughs> and uh, again how many of those do you take on board or how many try to you to distill it to what's the rule of thumb there i think it very much depends on the brief and what's been around i think the, the key thing is we normally would try and filter it uh, filter it significantly down but it really yeah just i think it depends massively on the scale of the challenge whether you've got if something massive you might only want 10 things that you start taking through Versus if you're actually looking at a whole process that you're mm-hmm. trying to Im- improve, you might have a lot of very small things mm-hmm. that you would be prepared still to consider taking on. And then uh, you write them down, you email them to people. What happens to these amazing ideas that you came up with? We, again, might have some tools to look at to help them prioritise and refine and build. It might actually be um, sketching it out. It could be a process map. It could be a number of different things, but you need to start making it visible and as tangible as possible mm-hmm. so you can start getting some feedback. And whose responsibility is it? Is it the, this innovation catalyst who's in charge of documenting everything that happened and kind of creating these process maps or whatever? Or is it everyone takes on a little bit and says, I'm responsible for this idea and I'll make it happen? I think the key thing is that the this kind of notion of ownership is really important, that it is, it is something that the promoter and the team own. And so certainly I think a lot of the innovation kind of hubs that we've got work in a similar way where with varying degrees of how much they'll take things along, it's more around trying to bring the collaboration and the kind of people together and ultimately the people who are going to um, deliver it need to kind of then you know mm-hmm. we'll normally keep that on and so they will then think about how they're going to bring it on but with the support of the resources we have in the business what is the name of the next stage after explode i assume it starts with e yes yes extracting Extract. so trying to think about which of the ideas you might want okay. to focus on and that really goes back to getting to your yeah. to your brief and making <laughs> sure that you're very clear on that and then after so extracting like, the next one is we would normally experiment, experiment so yeah. i think that some of the bits where um different approaches work slightly differently but i think fundamentally all of us believe at some point you need to before you go for a full launch you know it's mm-hmm. like how do you get some feedback on your idea and then really it's around defining how you know how can you understand mm-hmm. the the appeal of this as a as a piece and that might be that you use some research it could be that mm-hmm. um, you actually mock something up can you give an example of maybe a project or idea that and what this this experiment look like it's one of the exciting bits of results we have in the in the business now we've got um, UX designers and researchers so and they've typically worked in online on a recent project I did we actually brought them into a, a piece of work that was more around kind of physical product and in store mm-hmm. looking at our gifting gifting proposition so we launched find keep give last year and some of the things they were able to do was when we we're thinking about things like personalization and gift wrapping and the kind of the store experience they actually selected a number of test stores and they went out and they like watched what was happening currently. They did the they did the service. A number of guys in the team actually learned how to do the embossing. Mm-hmm. So they were able to do things like testing. They identified all their assumptions and were able to go, okay, we need to assume that we can get through this much, you know, this many items per amount of time. Mm-hmm. So they were able to test that. They were able to learn what what's the things that people most wanted to emboss because they were offering as a service. So they could kind of actually mm-hmm. go, actually, it's, it's slightly different than we thought. Not only demand, but also the practicality. So because on that team, you had the, the people responsible for designing the space and they were also involved in the testing piece, mm-hmm. they made really rich insights about actually the layout of this, even of this whole place it's not just around the aesthetics, but also the practicality of where am I going to store the embossing paper? How is this flow going to go? How do we communicate it? So it was a really, yeah, they kind of basically um, mm-hmm. pulled on the resource of the team using the UX design researchers to, to support them with that, but then mocking it up in store. And then how did they translate that into their final outcome? What was the result? The service has gone has gone live and think little things that they learned from that, I think, were, were things like, I don't know, like the rather than um, on the embossing, things like emojis and stuff were really actually way more popular than some of the initials, which they originally thought. So they mm-hmm. kind of had a bit of a different sense about the kind of execution that most mm-hmm. appeals. So yeah, so it was it was something that we've launched. They did test that it had a good appeal and it's, mm-hmm. it's come now out. Now at branch. Is there another stage after the experiment stage that you have... 
that starts with E. <laughs> Um, so really, I think at that point, you, you basically, I think with all these things, it's really interesting. Um, we've kind of talked about it as if it's like a, a linear process, yeah. but I think, um, you know, it's so, it yeah. so ends up being um, circular on these things. And that almost after you're kind of, you're through your exp- experimentation, there is a kind of going off to execute it, mm-hmm. which I've got less, less tools around it, really then comes back as a point where it transitions into... Um, a lot of the kind of governance of the organisation mm-hmm. but I think the key bit then is, is to remind people you've got that loop back round where you might find further briefs might come back out which then you're back to your you know examining piece but going okay what's, what's still not working well let's create that as a little brief and we'll take that through so yeah it's being prepared to, to keep looping. And this process because as you said it's very non-linear and uh, it's very new does it sometimes go wrong? I can't think of it on the top of my head, but I feel I feel sure we've had situations where mm-hmm. you would have got to a point where you might have think thought you were going in to run one kind of a workshop mm-hmm. and think, okay, it's a it's a brief to have ideas and we've got a nice clear brief, and then when you get to the session, you go, hang on a second, <laughs> actually we've got a lot of assumptions here, mm-hmm. and I think we need to go back round. Or actually, what I've realised is that not everybody here is engaged in the brief, mm-hmm. so it's kind of I think I think what you actually need is we need to go back and use some of the tools to yeah. get that alignment. So I think I undoubtedly have been times when we've when we've kind of picked the wrong, mm-hmm. not we've not realised exactly where we are in the process and gone round, but I think mm-hmm. it's not a, I think you have to be quite comfy with that. Yeah, I think the, the innovation process and people who do innovation talk a lot about failure mm-hmm. and the importance of failure and how we should embrace it, but I don't think it's easy for anyone, no matter how much we talk no. about it, especially when you have to explain that to the rest of the organisation, being part of a large organisation, explain to the rest of the organisation, why did you waste all this time for something that you you thought would work and it didn't do you ever have these difficult conversations and how do you or if anyone has to have that conversation Mm. what your advice would be i think you're very right to like draw on the power of stories and it's really interesting like what you choose to talk about and how Mm -hmm. you talk about things has quite a big impact on Mm -hmm. like the culture of an organization and i think if i think of some of the stuff we've done of late i think the big bit has been around setting up and we've been doing a lot of experiments lately on ways of working so we've been thinking about how differently to organise teams and, mm-hmm. and how how different different processes might help or, or hinder our results. And I think a big part of that then is around the heavy signposting up front around, you know, it is an experiment. Mm-hmm. And experiments mean we don't know what the answer is. And so we did a lot of communication up front around that through, um, I guess, all the kind of a, like a, a chunk of official challenge channels mm-hmm. that we have. So everything from in-house publications to intranet sites. And then we hosted kind of big drop-in sessions where anyone could come and hear about how all the different experiments we were planning on mm-hmm. running. And then subsequent to that, it was around trying to be really transparent about what then had happened, what what kind of different ways of working had worked and had not. Mm-hmm. And then that one, again, it was around trying to be very open and hear from the people who had been part of those experiments. Mm-hmm. So again, one of the big things we did, we had a lot of fairs almost where people were, anyone could drop in and we had the people involved in the different ways of working mm-hmm. and we encouraged them to be really honest about what, what had felt difficult yeah. what had been painful yeah. and to really land that land that message and I think as we've come to the end of some of those pieces it's been about making sure that you at least land the learn so if the overall thing hasn't worked mm-hmm. or it's been difficult mm-hmm. like let's at least celebrate the yeah. wins and I think that's been like, trying to mm-hmm. mix that message in. And what challenges do people usually highlight when the process wasn't easy what are the typical pain points of that well certainly one of the ones I worked on um, recently some of the some of the challenge was um, just even when you are experimenting I think is when you've got a small ex- um, when you're running an experiment mm-hmm. it's how it interfaces with the rest of a large organization mm-hmm. we called it a bit like the um, we were focusing particularly on empowerment and creating mm-hmm. how we could try and get the team to feel really empowered to own and make more mm-hmm. decisions at a, a different level of the organization and uh, one of the things we talked about was this almost like souffle effect because we did we found one of the things we learned we did an awful lot of stuff with that particular group to make them feel mm-hmm. to give them that that mm-hmm. responsibility and option to to decide how things would work but then they still had to keep there were a lot of instances where they start to plug into the rest of the business to actually deliver things mm-hmm. and that was quite a like a painful mm-hmm. point and so we shouted about about this piece yes yeah, so i like a souffle you take it out in the oven it's fine and then you open the oven door and it hits oh. the cold air and then it's like how do we sort this out? <laughs> so again that, that then was just around talking about the learns of that and saying mm-hmm. okay that has been a painful piece so next time we run an experiment we need mm-hmm. to think much more as uh, so we stakeholder mapping like where are where are all the interfaces that are going to be impacted by this particular experiment and we need to do a lot more to actually bring them into 
a feeling of ownership of this experiment too. Mm-hmm. So that's been a yeah that's interesting great. one. I mean, one of the things I really love is we have regular kind of council meetings. So we have a like a democratic structure linked to the fact we're all owners of the business and regularly kind of you have elected representatives and mm-hmm. they get to go and speak to leadership and ask questions from the constituencies mm-hmm. and they can challenge on absolutely anything. So whether it's around our reinvention strategy, what we're doing around product, what the, I know, pensions, anything, they can ask those questions of our leadership and those are all live streamed and people will tune in and watch the bits that they feel they feel they really want to understand so they can hear it firsthand if they don't want to wait for the, the in-house um, yeah. newspaper to report on it. So you can, you can get as yeah. close as possible wherever you are in the business to hearing it directly. I love it. It's like your little country with its government <laughs> and structure and meetings. It's brilliant. I think Facebook actually uses something similar. I think Mark Zuckerberg comes mm. out, I forgot, once a mm. year, once a month. Uh, and again, everyone can uh, mm. ask him a question from the entire mm. kind of audience. And I suppose that not just answers people's questions, but also shows the, the openness of the leadership team and mm. kind of uh, reinforces the culture where everyone has an opinion and can have a, a yeah. Same. And I think it's very it's very much about doing that. I and mean, I think I joined one last week, our, um, our kind of business partner um, from HR is looking at diversity and inclusion. And so she just posted out on our trading Google Plus community. Mm-hmm which there are many people to remember, and just said, you know, who, who's, who's interested in working with me on point on mm-hmm. diversity and inclusion? And so a number of us have volunteered, um, and that, that kind of stretches from people in our head office in all sorts of different roles, right the way up to um, our manufacturing site up in up north at Herbert Parkinson, and we've got two people who have joined from there, and so everyone's kind of self, uh-huh. self-organised to find solutions and then report back to our, our trading board. How is John Lewis preparing for the massive change and shift into in, in the way retail works and the way people interact with it? I think you, you basically um, draw it out, it is around experimenting, so it's around putting customer first, so thinking about understanding what our customers' wants and needs are. Mm-hmm. We're doing everything from having a got an in-house futurologist um, mm-hmm. who kind of looks at modeling much these kind of bigger further mm-hmm. out trends as a way of uh, um, informing our thinking right the way through to the here and now we've got our own in-house research lab so we can show people concepts we can mm-hmm. look at what they can show in computer screens we can do all sorts of things and actually people can view it so people within the organization can go and keep close to mm-hmm. what's going on for our customers uh, and get feedback from partners themselves as well on the front line so I think there's a there's a piece then around really thinking about customers first and then being prepared to experiment with different with different solutions. So we've just, I think, really just been prepared to, you have to just really embrace yeah. that spirit of reinvention yeah. and not any, hang on to where you are. Any examples of the experiments that you're running right now, maybe you ran in the past that were very interesting? Yeah, I think, I think, um, I think broadly it feels like it, with so the way retail's going that you've kind of got the, like two kind of big areas. So I think one of them is around that, that piece about ease and um, making things really easy for people and putting giving customers far more control to fit mm-hmm. around their their lives. And I think the other one, particularly for those who's with bricks, is, is around the experience. And I think you know there's been a little trend for a little while now in terms mm-hmm. of thinking about the ex- how you make the physical space something that's way more experiential. I think one of the interesting um, pieces that kind of fits in those at the moment is we're looking at um, beauty confidential. So within our um, fashion directorate there and our product services guys, they've been developing a concept and trialling it in a couple of locations at the moment with um, impartial beauty advice. So allowing people to come in and get skincare and makeup mm-hmm. um, advised purely around their, their needs and thinking mm-hmm. about that, that experience of that journey. And in terms of the, the retail in general and kind of what the physical stores, mm. what kind of part they will play in the mm. future, do you have any thoughts, maybe you're all not necessarily mm. kind of the way John Lewis is going, what with the boom of online retail and the ease of storing and mm. buying things uh, when they're online, what will be the role of uh, physical stores in, in let's say, five, ten years? Purely from my personal experience, I think there's, there's still a space for physical retail and you can see that looking at a number of online retailers very much still wanting to find either temporary or permanent sort of tangible mm-hmm. space to, to showcase and give, give customers the opportunity that whether it's to touch and feel the product or to experience mm-hmm. the brand in a in a more immersive way. So I think I think there is still a very much a space for physical spaces. I think the bit that's going to be interesting, speaking personally, is like how how that space is 
is going to change. So yeah, I think I think there's a there's a definite need for it to to yeah. kind of evolve. I can't say that we're going to lose the high street yeah. in its entirety. I mean, I'm personally looking forward to how the retail will evolve, and I think there is a lot of opportunities for many many retail stores to do a better job. But mm. I agree with you that it's definitely about the kind of the ease of the experience as well as the making it very special mm. and very personal. And I I shop a lot online, but I still like going to stores and touching things and yeah. talking to someone. I think it can be yeah, it can be a really rich experience. I, one of the ones I, I just is a really fabulous place. I'm um, just because it's a um, charity I've been involved in recently is Ministry of Stories. Mm. Um, I wonder if you've come across the Monster Supply Shop, but that's um, that to me is an amazing example of a totally immersive experience. So what is that? Um, well, the charity itself is all around helping kids to get um, involved in writing and literacy. Mm-hmm. But the I guess almost as a way of with raising funds and also to bring their their kind of mission to life a bit the the front of their place is actually a shop designed for monsters so it sells everything that a monster might need and it's the the level of that experience is really really deep and i would yeah i encourage anyone to back it because it's a a fantastic charity is it in the uk yes it's in london so when people come here you might want to might want to consider a trip down there so definitely definitely i have a last question for you that i ask uh, maybe you know all of our guests if you personally could change one thing in the world what would it be? Ooh, no, I didn't know. Otherwise, I would have had a really good <laughs> thing. I'm like, oh my god! If I could, if I was magic wand on anything, this feels like a kind of and what do you call it a beauty pageant moment. I think it would be around. It would be about collaboration. It'd be about getting people to work um, and to each appreciate everybody's individual differences, but to come together. And I think too often in life we generalize or we think of people as being separate. We focus on our own little piece. Mm-hmm. And I think now more than ever, it's it's that piece about being inclusive and looking at. Um, yeah, looking at collaborating better, whether that's in a work context or in a wider sense. Oh, that is a fantastic answer, especially because it definitely goes along with everything that we appreciate and we value. It's all about connecting people around the world and bringing people together. I, yeah. I feel very passionate about that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for watching us. Um, don't forget to subscribe underneath this video. There will be more interviews coming out about innovation in design and creativity. So please do not miss them. And uh, thanks a lot. And until next time.